Today, uh, we're going to focus this week on multiples. I'm going to start out with lecture note six and talk about multiples. Um, but before I do, just a quick word. I have a couple people who are taking the midterm that have an excuse to take it by Wednesday, so I'm not going to talk about the midterm today. We'll talk about the midterm on Wednesday. Okay. So <clears throat> today, we're going to modify two Excel spreadsheets that you're going to need to do the multiples assignments that are coming up. So what I would strongly suggest is following along in Excel so that you can have these files ready to go because you'll need both of these files to complete the assignment. So let's just talk about multiples in general. <clears throat> this is the fourth part of your group project. Okay, we've covered the first three. The EIC, the historical analysis, the, the valuation. So the fourth part is going to be multiples. And that's what we're going to focus on this week. Multiples are not a sort of a different way of valuing a company. It's really just, you're going to quickly see today, it's based on rearranged math, right? So it's really just a process point of view. When we do DC evaluation, we start with <coughs> the forecast, and that leads to a price. Multiples are just kind of working backwards. We kind of start with a price, and we work backwards to understand what decisions led to that price. So that's the, the general difference between multiples and DCF. They're actually, they should sync together at the end of the day. Now, essentially for multiples, they're also called comparables or comparables because what you often do is you'll compare multiple companies to see why they are trading at different prices. And <coughs> the most important part of the multiple analysis is to find similar companies. Okay, so for example, Google Alphabet and Snap are actually not very good comparable companies, right? Because even though they're both tech firms doing social media, they're at completely different stages of their life cycle, right? Google's a much bigger, more mature company. Their growth rates are going to be different. Snap has never made money, so the returns are going to be different. So therefore, even though people will do multiples on them, they're actually not very comparable. So one of the key parts is that Multiples, as you're going to quickly remember, are a expression of growth and ROIC and cost of capital, so growth and spread. That's all multiples are. So ideal comparables are companies that have similar growth, similar spread. That's better for multiple analysis. Okay, and that'll be some of the basis for what we're going to do today. So multiples can also help us if we want to value private companies and or they're used in M&A transactions. Matter of fact, a useful feature of Bloomberg is if you go to Bloomberg and you type in M&A, mergers and acquisitions, like if any deal is announced, you can quickly get the details of the de deal here in Bloomberg. So for example, um, who's in the news for a big acquisition right now? It's Broadcom, Qualcomm, and uh, who else? Well, let's just type in Broadcom. Here's Broadcom. <clears throat> and you can see that basically Broadcom, Qualcomm made the $100 billion deal. Actually, there was a um, potential bid for Intel buying Broadcom that, that was rumored in the market. There's the rumored deal there. But nonetheless, if you go to the Qualcomm deal, then you'll see here this was, you know, blocked by the U.S. government, but uh, regardless, when they did the financials and deal comps, like these are actually the deal comps and the multiples associated with the deal that were being paid based on other similar transactions. So again, another use for where you might see multiples in the real world, okay? But for our purposes today, these are the steps that we're about to follow. So first part is making sure we get the right range of companies to actually compare against. Secondly, we need forward data, okay, because we're based on future cash flows, not historical cash flows. So forward multiples, forward data. And then <clears throat> we will calculate and explain the differences. This semester, these are the six multiples that you're going to be responsible for. Uh, PE, PEG, EV to sales, EV to EBITDA, EV to EBIT, and price to book. Okay, so let's start by creating a template in Bloomberg to get this information. 
So you'll need this template. And let's go back to Delta Airlines to create it, which is the company we were working on last week. So here is Delta Airlines. Go to RV, and then go to Custom, and then we're going to start creating this custom template. Okay? So start out with the enterprise value multiples. There are three that you will need. So add column. EV space divided by sales. Now, what matters is what's called forward year two. Okay, we've already started to do this. We built our valuation model. So again, FY1 is the current year that's not complete. FY2 is the next full year. That's what is more normalized. That is what is more standardized. So Bloomberg knows this. So let's go back. EV to sales, Bloomberg actually has two fields here, EV to this year's estimated sales, EV to next year's estimated sales. This is EV to FY1, EV to FY2. Because they know the analysts are using this pretty heavily, it's right here as two predefined fields. It's actually multiple ways to get the same data in Bloomberg. So we can always go to EV best sales as another alternative. BEST stands for Bloomberg Estimate. So BEST means you can access the Bloomberg Consensus Estimate Database, and we could specifically make some adjustments to get to next year's sales. But out of convenience, we're going to use EV to next year's estimated sales. Enter. And that is the first multiple. So right now, this industry is trading at 90 cents, 0.90, per dollar of sales. So what that means is, one dollar of revenue generates 90 cents of value okay for delta one dollar of sales would generate 94 cents of value okay so basically if they drive more revenue then their value slash stock price proxy would go up by about 94 percent for every dollar of sales all right so again that's ev to sales next ev to ebitda ev space slash ebitda Again, EV to this year's estimated EBITDA. We actually want next year's estimated EBITDA. So this industry is trading at 4.98 times next year's EBITDA. Delta's trading at 4.65. So if Delta were to get one more dollar of EBITDA, it would create 4.65% of extra enterprise value. That's the way to think about the multiple. Okay, the next multiple is EV to EBIT, EV space slash EBIT. So show more matches, scroll down, and just look for EV to EBIT next year. There's a lot of similar ratios in Bloomberg. So EV to next year estimated EBIT. By the way, when you click on any of these, it'll give you the definitions over here on the right. Okay, those are our three enterprise value multiples. Next, we're going to do this on the PE multiples. So P slash E, price to earnings ratio, and we want the estimated PE for next year. Next, we'll need the PEG ratio, which is the PE divided by the long-term growth rate in earnings per share. So PEG stands for PEG, and we want the best uh, estimated PEG ratio for next year. So this will be the second year PE divided by the long-term growth rate in EPS. So another way to think about the PEG ratio, Kramer likes this ratio. A lot of traders will use the PEG ratio as a rule of thumb. So the idea is a PEG of one means a dollar of long-term earnings or dollar of earnings per share growth increases the value, the price to earnings by a dollar. So I basically pay a dollar to get a dollar. Okay. Now a peg of 0.37 means for every dollar of EPS growth, Delta's value is going to go up 37 cents. So a rule of thumb for traders is companies that have pegs below one are cheap. Okay. Because I'm basically getting I'm only paying 37 cents for a dollar of earnings per share growth. 
so I can get a dollar for 37 cents. All right, some people would argue that's cheap. However, you got to be careful because it also could mean that the company is not expected to do well. And that's why people aren't paying well more for their earnings per share of growth. So again, the other side of this is a company that has a peg above two is considered expensive. They'll say it's rich. Okay, because again, two means I'm paying two dollars for every dollar of earnings growth. So I'm paying a lot for those earnings. So Google would have a high peg, but Google's also expected to do well. So you probably would expect it to pay a high pre-E for that growth. So again, you gotta be careful about rules of thumbs, but nonetheless. PEG is a trading rule of thumb that's often used. And then finally, we have what's called the price to book multiple, P slash B. And we're going to use the current price to book. That is the price per share divided by the book value per share off the balance sheet. Okay? So those are the six ratios that we're going to be using this semester. And just to make sure that you actually are having the same numbers I do, so you don't actually have the wrong ratio by mistake, make sure you're using for comp source, analyst curated BI, Bloomberg Intelligence, comparables. All right, because basically what this means is somebody went through the GICS codes at Bloomberg and said, we think that these are the most reasonable peers to compare against. Okay, so for your group projects, it's okay to use the analyst curated peers for Bloomberg. Okay. The other way that you can actually find peers is you can get it off the ANR screen. If you go to any individual analyst in ANR, you'll see who their peers that they cover are. But regardless, before we save this template, we're going to add one more ratio, which is PEG is based on what's called LTG of EPS. So in our evaluation, we use G, which is growth in free cash flow into perpetuity. Here, growth is growth in EPS, right? It's, so when they do the PEG ratio, it's based on growth in EPS, not growth in free cash flow. And their definition at Wall Street of, of long-term is five years. So when they say long-term growth rate, they're saying the five-year growth rate in EPS. That's what LTG represents. So basically, <clears throat> to understand the PEG ratio, we're going to put in LTG, and we want the best LTG EPS, best is Bloomberg estimate, long-term growth, five years, earnings per share. Select that from one day ago, <clears throat> which means it's going to use the current earnings estimates from the last business day. So in this case, it would be Friday for Delta Airlines. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> this is the PE in two years <clears throat> divided by the five-year growth in EPS that the analyst projected as of Friday. And that's what we have here for the PEG ratio. So 19.4% is what their earnings are going to grow per year for five years. So long story short, I want to take this template and save it. Name it whatever you want. I'm going to call it multi SPR for spring. But you can call it whatever you want, multiples up to 11 characters. But nonetheless, you're going to be using this template a lot the rest of the semester, so make sure you create this template. And since there's a lot of very similar variables, similar to the model, make sure you got the right one. So we're all using consistent variables and data. So I'll leave this up here for a second. Questions about any of the numbers? Could you guys match this? Particularly delta and market cap weighted average. They should be identical. You did forward year two and you followed along, you should have this template. All right, click on settings. Make sure in global settings that your Excel export mode is exporting static data. We had some people in the previous class that were exporting dynamic links will cause all sorts of problems. So make sure it is saved for static data. Then go to output and dump this into Excel. So this is what we just created now in Excel. Okay. Next step, take the delta valuation model that we worked on last week, the as-is delta valuation model. That would be this file. Okay. With both spreadsheets open, 
the delta valuation model and the data you just exported from Bloomberg, file, save the Bloomberg data somewhere. So I'll save it to my downloads folder. So I'll just call this delta multiple. And this is what I'm doing on the video. Okay. So basically have both of these files open. Then right click on the Excel file just exported from Bloomberg. Mover copy. Switch to the delta valuation model. Scroll down, move to end, OK. So what you did is you basically took that multiple file and you put it as the last tab in the delta valuation model. Because going forward, we're going to do a multiples analysis along with every valuation. So the last tab will be the file that we will be using for that valuation. Okay, questions? Can you reshot So again, you have to have both files open. So let's say I had this file open again. The bottom where it says worksheet, hover your mouse over that and right click with your mouse. Move or copy. Switch where it says to book, switch to the valuation model. And ideally, you can put it anywhere, but we wanted to have it at the end. So move to the end, hit OK, and it will move it. That's how you move a, a worksheet across workbooks in Excel. Okay? So we now have in our delta model that final tab should be these multiples. Then, once you have it here, you can rename this set of worksheet. We can call this multiples. Spell right, multiples. Then I want you to take row one, and I want you to insert a blank row, so that the file that you just put in, row one is blank. And so it actually starts at row two. Just insert row one, blank row. Now, here's why. Little detour. This is enterprise value to next year sales, as we observed in the market today. On our DCF valuation, this is enterprise value. And on our income tab, this is forward year to revenue. So we actually have in our model, the equivalent of a forecasted multiple. So we have the observed multiple that's coming from Bloomberg, and we have the forecasted model multiple that we could create based on our target share price. We're going to eventually sync these together. But in order to do this, we need to make sure that they're both calculated the same way. So here's where we have to go back 31 years into the past. So this is when I was back in school, actually I was in school in the late 80s, but the point is, around the time, mid-1980s, when Bloomberg got started, one of the pitches that Bloomberg made, Michael Bloomberg made to Wall Street, he said, look, we at Bloomberg will calculate all the ratios on your behalf in real time, and if we all agree on it, you don't all have to do it, we can all do all this data for you, automated, and we can all look at the same moment, same source of truth. All right, so as long as we can agree on the formulas, we can agree on looking at this data real time. So at the time, all the stuff we're talking about was just created by the University of Chicago. Everything came from Chicago at that time. Matter of fact, in the late 1980s, when I was a warden, the textbook that I used for finance was written by the guys at Chicago and my professor to teach finance his PhD at Chicago. So they sent their PhDs out to the top business schools. In the late 80s, they wrote all the textbooks, created all the formulas, and they partnered with Bloomberg and Wall Street to create the formulas that you see today. Okay? Now, here's the thing. We today are looking at an enterprise value formula, which is based on Modigliani-Miller. 
That's this formula. Bloomberg, which hasn't changed the formula in 30 years, if you go to FA, the very first tab, it's called Key Stats, this is how Bloomberg calculates enterprise value from 30 years ago when they synced up with the academics and with the Wall Street professionals. So here's the point. They calculate enterprise value. It's done a slightly different way. Not saying it's right or wrong. People choose to make shortcuts. And I told you to be in this class, I would explain when shortcuts were made. Here's an example of one of them. So you remember our one, two, three, four model? One is what? One, two, three, four. What's one? Operating assets. Two? Non operating. Three? Debt. Four? Equity. Okay? So let's look at this. This is the value of the common stock. One, two, three, and four. What do we call this? Market capitalization. That's a four. Cash. Think excess cash. Two. Excess cash is non operating. Two. Preferred and other types of equity. Four. Interest bearing debt. Three. So basically, equity minus cash plus other equity plus debt equals enterprise value. Debt minus cash is called net debt. Net debt plus equity equals enterprise value. That's what they did 30 years ago. This is where net debt came into play. Debt minus cash. Net debt. They didn't dis distinguish between operating and excess cash. They just said debt minus all cash. That's permeated its way all through the textbooks for 30 years. And that's why I said when they say net debt, they use debt minus cash. And we're using debt minus excess cash because it's probably more realistic. But the rule of thumb has been debt minus cash. And that was set up a long time ago. Debt, plus, debt minus cash plus equity is Bloomberg's definition of enterprise value. Four plus three is enterprise value. Minus two. If we took our enterprise value and we subtracted the non-operating <coughs> assets, what are we left with in our model? This would be a great essay question on the midterm if we had gotten to this point last week. So we didn't. Have to save it for the final exam. So if this is enterprise value and we subtract the twos, the cash, what are we left with? What's it trying to approximate? This minus cash, what are you left with? Close concept. What are you left with? Operating value. See, what the rest of the world calls enterprise value is closer to what's called operating value by Medigliani, Miller, and McKinsey. It's not right or wrong. Definitionally, what they do. So here's the point. If we looked at an enterprise value based on our calculation of the academic version, and we compared it to the Bloomberg version, it's not the same thing. So we're going to have to put the two together. Now here's the thing. Why do they do it this way? Well, again, back in the 80s, it really was a simpler time. Because back in the 80s, what were the non-operating assets? It was really cash. We didn't have a lot of joint ventures. We didn't have a lot of IP. So all those non-operating assets that we have today, 30 years ago, nobody had them on their balance sheet. So when people thought about non-operating assets, they just thought about cash lying around. That's why net debt, and to some degree, this formula was created 30 years ago to be this. It would be changed if they were creating it today, but they didn't, and this has been the standard that's been in there in existence for 30 years. And it's still taught in all the textbooks. So let me go forward. So here's the point. It's not exact because today we're breaking out operating cash from excess cash. Again, they didn't really think that way 30 years ago. So it's not exact. So let's make it an equivalent. So what we're going to do in cell E10, Bloomberg Enterprise Value Equivalent. This is how Bloomberg, using data in our model, would calculate enterprise value. Debt plus equity minus cash. That's their formula. So equals, actually, sorry, I don't want to put it here. 
I want to put it here for enterprise value. Equals enterprise value minus cash. And I'm going to grab it right off the balance sheet because they don't distinguish between operating and excess cash. So for the last reported year, 2017, minus operating cash, minus excess cash. This is the way Bloomberg would calculate it. This is the way we calculate it in our model. Okay? So, why does that matter? Multiples. EV to sales equals D1 from our DCF, the Bloomberg Enterprise value, divided by, from the income tab, second forward year, forward year one, forward year two, revenue. That's the EV to sales from our model. That's the EV to sales for Delta Airlines today, 0.94. Now, obviously, we did the valuation at a different time. The share price aren't matching up. Multiples don't change. Doesn't matter. But this is what you need to do to set up your model. And it will matter when we do the next valuation. EV to EBITDA equals Bloomberg Enterprise Value divided by Income Tab 2019 EBITDA. EV to EBIT equals Enterprise value divided by EBIT off the income tab, forecasted EBIT 2019. And finally, P to E ratio. Price to earnings is off the DCF. This is our price, which is the common equity value, divided by income 2019 net income for common shareholders. There's my PE. So this would be the multiples created by the model. This would be the observed multiples in the real world. And this would be the industry range. Yes? EV to which one? So it's basically the Bloomberg Enterprise Value, not the one from our model, because we want to do an apples to apples comparison. And then from the income tab, we want second forward year, so 2019 revenue. And then EVD, but da, same thing. The Bloomberg Enterprise Value, calculation in our model, divided by second forward year, so 2019 EBITDA. And the third one is the Bloomberg Enterprise Value divided by 2019 operating income or EBIT. So basically, this is what we're creating in our model, because our model forecasts a price which creates multiples. And this is the observed data in the marketplace today for Delta. And as we change our share price, the multiples will adjust. Now, here's a preview of the assignment that you're about to get. You've done a bull and the bear. Okay? Just conceptually, what was the difference between the bull and the bear versus the target? What's the bull, conceptually? Being more aggressive. Being more aggressive. So how high being more aggressive could the share price get in the next 12 months with the bull? Yeah. Make sense? OK. Replace share price with multiples. Because share price is a multiple. It's multiple of earnings is share price. So what's the bull using multiples? How high could this multiple be in the next 12 months? How low could this multiple be in the next 12 months? So instead of doing a bull to bear based on share price, you're going to do a bull to bear based on multiples. Let me give you an example. Delta today is trading at an EV to sales of 0.94. That means for every dollar of revenue, they're worth 94 cents. How high could this multiple get in the next 12 months? How low could this multiple get in the next 12 months? Okay, here's the reason why I put competitive data. What's the range of EV to sales in this industry? What's the low? What's the lowest number that we observe? And what's the highest? 1.78. OK, 
Okay, so I come up with this number. Is that a realistic EV to sales for Delta? That's the other advantage of doing it this way. Sanity test. See, when you do your bull and your bear, you're just coming up with an absolute price. All right? But we don't know if our absolute price is truly reasonable. We're just basing it on assumptions. So here's the nuance. Instead of doing a price, we're going to do it based on a multiple. And by looking at the trading ranges of the industry, it will help us from doing something that is just unrealistically crazy. Because we might talk ourselves into Delta doubling its share price, but if that means that they're going to trade at two times sales and they're going to trade at almost 14 times EBIT, is anybody trading remotely close to 14 times EBIT? No, so that is probably not a share price Delta is going to realistically see in the next 12 months, no matter how well things go. That's why we're doing multiples. And this will be part of your next assignment. So you will be given a company. You will be given the ability to do a bull and a bear. Your bull and your bear write-up will explain the multiples, not the share prices. Which means you got to get good at understanding why there's differences in multiples. So this is the next part of the assignment. Here is the key value drivers formula we've been using all semester. Again, I'm assuming you read the book. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to replace the key value drivers formula with equity to get an actual PE. So instead of no plat, it's net income. Instead of ROIC, it's ROE. Instead of cost of capital, it's cost of equity. And instead of growth in free cash flow, growth in no plat, it's growth in net income, <coughs> growth in EPS. You put those four things into that formula, and you actually get a PE multiple and an operating value that is equity based, based on share market cap, basically, is what you're looking at. So create a brand new spreadsheet. File new. Let's make this bigger. 200%. Let's look at Procter & Gamble, PG, <clears throat> and let's put in the key value driver equation. Expected net income, expected growth in net income, expected return on equity. Expected cost, or just not expected, just cost of equity, and this would get us our market cap, basically the value. Okay, this would be our model PE, and this would be the observed. <coughs> PE in the marketplace. Now, for Procter & Gamble, we can go to Bloomberg. So type in PG, type in WAC. Right now, cost of equity, 7.7%. Not the WAC, the cost of equity. Next, EEO. We can see that for 2019, based on today's share price, Procter & Gamble's price to earnings, second forward year, 1705. We can see that second forward year, 2019, expected net income, adjusted, 
11898. We can see that the expected return in equity for the next three years is 19.5, 21.1, and 24.1. So we just need something representative, so I'm going to take an average of the three. If the average of three is not representative, we need to put in something that is representative. So I'll do the average of the three as a starting point. So 19 and a half, 5 plus <coughs> 0.212 with rounding plus 0.241. Divided by three, so somewhere around 22%, 21.6% on a go forward basis is the expected return in equity for Procter and Gamble based on the consensus for the next three years. Okay, we can adjust it up or down a little bit. We're in the ballpark. So we've already done this. You know what we're about to do? We're about to solve for a G. We've been doing it for the last three weeks in our model. We're just going to more formally do it here. Except here's the point. We're going to use the market cap which is based on <coughs> this formula. So let's just put our key value drivers formula in to this spreadsheet. Equals left paren profit times left paren 1 minus growth divided by the return right paren right paren divided by left paren the cost of equity minus the G and we get a market cap of about $154.5 billion with no growth. And the PE, this is the price, this is the earnings, that we're forecasting would be about 13, 12.99. So the model says 13, the market says 17, so obviously they're expected to grow. How fast? Well, let's put in 2%. Well, not two, three. I want these two to match. So somewhere between two and three, 2.7, 2.6, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11. Based on today's trading price. Yes. That's just the key value drivers formula. That's all it is. with the correct order of operations. And then you take the market cap divided by the net income, and that's your PE. And we're just basically solving for the G that explains it. Okay, now, <clears throat> CLX, Clorox, competitor of Procter & Gamble. Go back. Clorox has a WAC 7.9 for cost of equity. Clorox right now is trading at a multiple of 2019 earnings of 19.71. Clorox has 19, 2019 earnings of 842.1 million. And Clorox has an expected return on equity which doesn't exist in the Bloomberg forecast. And the reason why is because they bought back so much common stock, they've wiped out their equity with the share repurchases. So they have negative equity. So they don't really have a return on equity. But in analyzing it previously, it's around 70% for an operating ROIC, or, or an operating return on equity. So we're going to call it 70%. Okay? So market cap. Model PE, 
obviously they're expected to grow. How much? Let's put in 3%. 3.1. Somewhere in the middle. 305. Close enough. Save. So this is the bolt comp video. I hate to see this crash and burn <laughs> as I made all these changes. So <clears throat> this is what's called comparable or comparable analysis. A premium means the multiple is higher than its peers and or the average. A discount means the multiple is lower than its peers or the average. Why is Procter & Gamble trading at a discount to Clorox? Because Procter & Gamble's PE is 17, Clorox's PE is almost 20. Why is Procter & Gamble's PE at a discount? Why is it 17, not at 20? And by the way, this is advanced. This is not what people are taught in the real world. What people are taught in the real world is what you were taught in 340, which is, and this is, gets a little naive, which is to say, oh, Procter & Gamble's cheap because you can buy Procter & Gamble at 17, Clorox is trading at 20, so you're getting them for cheap. All right? And I see you shaking your heads because that's the point, is that that's not the way it really works. Why is Procter & Gamble, quote, unquote, cheap? Why are they trading at a lower multiple? What, what's the data telling us? It's on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty high market cap. Well, that, but what's causing it? Think about the key value drivers, growth and spread. Who's got the lower growth rate? Procter & Gamble's got the lower growth rate? Look at the difference in G's. Procter & Gamble's G is about 2.5%. Clorox G's 3%. What I'm telling you, if Procter & Gamble is going to trade at 20 times earnings, they need a higher growth rate. So let's, let's flip this around. One of the reasons why Procter & Gamble is trading at a discount is because they're not growing as fast or is expected to grow as fast as Clorox. That's one of the reasons why they're trading at a discount. Second reason is because not only are they trading 50 basis points slower, but they're also trading at one-third the ROE. So for similar cost of capital, the slower growth and lower ROE is why they're trading at 17 times earnings, not 19.7 times earnings. Does everybody see that? Because this is your homework that you're going to have to write up very quickly. So I just want to make sure that you know how to do this. Yes? Where are you getting, like you're saying it's a discount compared to what, Clorox? Yes. Okay, I don't know. That's called discount. So typically, what you're going to eventually do is you'll have company, company, industry average. Or, let me show you what you'll actually have. RV, custom, multiples. Industry average, Clorox. Clorox is trading at a slight premium to industry average. Procter & Gamble is trading at a discount to industry average. Explain. By the way, there's six multiples that you have to explain. We're just starting with number one. And there's n number of companies that you have to explain. We're just starting with two. Okay? But I'm saying in a month, when you're doing your final group projects, you'll do at least six companies, and you'll do multiple analysis on multiple of these ratios. And it'll be really clear to you, or it should be, so that you can make it really clear to me why these companies are trading at premiums or discounts. And you can't just say Procter & Gamble's cheap because it's less than the industry average. Okay, great. You figured that out last class. Now, why? The why is the key value drivers. This is advanced, but I'm telling you, this will make you good because there's nobody that's taught to do it this way. They do the simple way where they just say, oh, you're trading at a discount, therefore, you're trading below average, you'll eventually trade at the average, so you'll just go up by Procter & Gamble because they're cheap. No, they're not cheap. They're performing less well. That's why they're cheap. And we know that the expectations are lower. That's why they're cheap. And we know what we'll have to change in those expectations 
in order to get them to trade in that premium. That's what's going to matter that you guys have to start to understand. Questions? Great. <clears throat> so, in the interest of time, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Let's do Estee Lauder. Okay? Because they're on this list. Here's Estee. So, EL. Okay, what do we know about Estee? Well, very quickly, right here on the page, we know their EV to EBIT is 22.45. It's like Sesame Street. One of these things doesn't look like the other. 22.45. This is a premium multiple compared to the other two. Trading much higher. This is on YouTube. You get to hear me singing on YouTube. Okay. Don't make this some kind of mem. All right, so back to this. What do we know about Clorox and Estee Lauder? Let's switch to Estee Lauder. Here's the WAC. 8.2. Net income. 1, 2, forward year, 18.25. What do we know about the return in equity? 0.348 plus 0 0.408, 0 0.443, close to 40% the next three years. So very quickly, Why is Estee Lauder trading at a premium? Yeah. Because the investors expect their uh, uh, net income to grow 4.22% per year. That's right. And why not Clorox, which has a 70% ROE? Uh, because their cost of equity is a lot higher. That's right. So there's two factors. One is even though they're growing faster, they don't have the same ROE, so it's not as valuable. And they're trading a little bit of a discount versus what it could have been if they had the same cost of equity. So there's a little bit more risk in Estee Lauder, so they're being discounted a little bit more. Okay? But that's what I'm saying. We now understand what's different about these three numbers. And we can more granularly explain these three numbers, these three stocks. Let's continue on. Enterprise value to EBIT. New tab. This is PE. New tab. Enterprise value to EBIT. <coughs> Make this bigger. This, again, we've been doing this for several weeks in the model. You've read the book. This is the formula that gets us from, enter, from key value drivers to EV to EBIT. This is the formula for EV to EBIT. The new thing that's added, tax rate. Tax rate, G, which is growth in free cash flow or no plat. ROIC, WAC. Four factors. So, I'll take it from the previous tab. Same three companies. We need an expected tax rate. We need an expected uh, G. We need an expected ROIC. And we need a WAC. And that will get us our model 
ev to ebit, and will get us our observed ev to ebit. I'll save. So, tax rate. Let's go ahead and start looking them up. I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use the transcript analyzer, but this will be going through the, the EVT screen and looking at the transcripts. So, let's look at for single security, Estee Lauder, let's look up the tax rate. See if there's any mentions. 22.3. Our expected tax rate is expected to be 27%. So let's use 27%. Okay, let's look up Clorox. For Clorox, Tax rate of 21 is what they're going to say. Oh, no, wait a minute. Effective tax rate, understand Tax Reform Act, be about 23 to 24. So we'll call it 24. And for Procter & Gamble, Twenty three four is what it is now. Uh, effective tax rate twenty four. Last earnings call. So twenty three four twenty four. We'll call it twenty. Call it twenty three. Just twenty three four. We'll give them a little bit of break. All right. Point is, figure out the tax rates. Then we need the operating ROICs. Here's the deal. We can't do the operating ROICs without doing the valuations. So we need the valuations, the as-is valuation, to figure out the operating ROIC. So that's the other thing we're going to need to do. Three as-is valuations on Wednesday during class coming up. So let's go back. I can cheat because I actually have, and you don't yet, <coughs> the ability to estimate operating ROIC within Bloomberg. This is an estimate of the operating ROIC, but you'll do this in the three valuations you'll do. Custom formulas. Este 30%. So let's do 30%. Procter and Gamble. Is Call it 17.7 and Clorox 32.8. I'll just add the wax here. Today the wax are Procter and Gamble 6.98. Round off, we can call that 7. For Clorox, 7.32. And is SD on this list? Seven point seven nine. Okay, so what's the formula for enterprise value to EBIT? Well, it's right here. So let's go ahead and put it in. Equals left paren, 1 minus the tax rate, right paren, times left paren, 1 minus the growth, divided by the operating ROIC. 
take all of that, divide by what paren WAC minus G. <coughs> that is what the model would calculate. Make this two decimal places. Copy this across. And these would be the observed EV to EBITs. So let's go back to our template that we just created on multiples. <coughs> and let's get the EV to EBITs. Este, 22.35. For Procter & Gamble and Clorox, it would be EB to EBIT, Procter's 13.78, and Clorox is 13.78. So what are our G's here? Maybe two. It's probably not going to be too different than the other G's that we looked at. So maybe what, 2.1, 2.05, something like that. Close. What's this one going to be? Three. A little less than three, 2.8. 2.7275, something like that. And this one's going to be 4. Five. So again, we have a pretty clear path to understanding why Estee Lauder is trading at a premium to the industry and to their two peers, and why their peers are trading at a discount. Despite the higher tax rate, the G at Estee Lauder is much higher than Procter & Gamble and Clorox, 5% versus 2 and 2.75. The ROIC is expected to be about the same as Clorox and, again, about significantly higher than Procter & Gamble. So that's the point. Why are people buying Estee Lauder versus Clorox? It's about the G. That G is the difference between trading at 15 times and 22 times earnings. And that's why people like Estee Lauder, all that expected growth. That's the problem with Clorox. They lack the growth. They got the great returns. They don't have the growth. The challenge of Procter & Gamble is they're missing both. They're the slowest of the growers, and they have the least return. And even though they're a little bit less risky, the problem is they're still trading a discount because of those other two factors. This is what I'm saying. You understand why these numbers are different. You will be explaining why these numbers are different. That's the second multiple for your assignments, okay? Or the 500 words that you're about to write up, okay? Then, number three. Multiple number three, EV2 sales, okay? So, let's go back to this template. And the problem with this template is I don't see, so we go to the analyst curated ones. Is Estee on this list? Good. Estee's on this list. Analyst curated. So I got Procter & Gamble, I got Clorox, I got Estee, all on our template if I use Analyst curated. Output Excel. So we're going to dump the template that we just created into Excel for the multiples. So those are the multiples for all those companies in real time. Here's the other thing we're going to do. Formula. This is enterprise value to EBIT. What you read in the book is that, and this is what we've been doing in our model, is enterprise value to sales is margin times enterprise value to EBIT. That was the derivation. So margin is enterprise value to sales divided by enterprise value to EBIT. Let's go back. Equals estimated margin. 
equals this divided by that. That is the estimated margin for each of these companies. So Procter & Gamble, 22.6. EV to sales. Estimated margin. Estimated margin for Procter & Gamble is 22.6. Estimated margin for Estee Lauder, 17.2. Estimated margin for Clorox, 18.9. EV to sales. <coughs> Easier to see on the Bloomberg screen. 3.12. Clorox is, damn it, Clorox, it, uh, damn you, Bloomberg, you see the screen I want to see. For Procter & Gamble is 3.12, Clorox is 2.89, and Estee is 3.85. What was that one, 2. Point what? Thank you. All right, why is the market trading the EV to sales at a discount for Clorox versus Procter Gamble? EV to sales is based on margin. They have a lower margin, therefore I pay less than their sales. Interestingly, they have a low margin, but I pay a lot more for Estee Lauder sales. Okay, so here's the final thing. Productivity. My no plat margin equals my EBIT margin times one minus the tax rate. So that is my no plat margin. times productivity equals ROIC. This is the forecasted productivity for each firm. If I take my ROIC and I divide it by the margin, that is the productivity. Now, if I wanted to sync up with the ROIC tree in our model, it's the reciprocal of this. So 1 divided by that, that's the productivity in the ROIC tree. Lower is better. So what's the big difference between Procter & Gamble and Clorox in productivity? Which one's better? Clorox. Clorox uses half the capital to drive a dollar of sales. So I pay more for sales with Procter & Gamble, but I pay more for EBIT multiples and more for PE ratios. Why? Because they're going to get a better ROIC because they have the better productivity. So even though they get a better margin, they reinvest a whole lot less capital. What's true for Este? Este has the lowest margin, but they're also the most efficient in the industry. That's why I like their sales, and that's why I pay the most because they're also growing this the fastest. That's why I'm paying a premium. <coughs> so what I'm saying is, you will do these three ratios for three companies. You will understand the differences between these ratios for the three companies. You will write this up. Okay. So this is the last of the major assignments for the semester, and it's going to end up being 6% of your semester grade. Individual, due Monday.
Okay, you will start in class. Part of it will be due in class, end of class month, Wednesday. The rest of it will be due on Monday coming up. Okay, so I told you we we're splitting out the two assignments into this week. These are the two files you need to do those two assignments. So if you have any questions, ask now, because come Wednesday, you're gonna actually be doing. It. Yes. Would that be 10 a.m. Monday? <laughs> Your, well, your class starts on Wednesday at, are you talking about Wednesday? No, Monday? the Monday. The 10 a.m. 10 a.m. 10, 10 normal okay. assignment time. But you'll have time on Wednesday's class to do it using these tools. The difference is it's going to be three different companies. So you're going to have to do three different companies, all of this analysis plus write-up. You're going to do three different target valuations. One of them you'll do a bull and a bear, and you'll explain the bull and the bear using the multiples to talk about the sanity chest sanity test associated with the bull and the bear. So that's what the assignment is going to be. Okay, and again, there'll be a write-up explaining all of this individually, not group, that's due by next Monday. Okay, so we've laid the groundwork for all the analysis you have to do, and we set up the templates. So now all I have to do is give you the three names, and in class you'll be able to go starting Wednesday at the beginning of class time. So make sure you get to this point before Wednesday's class. I've just finished recording this. I'm posting this on YouTube. So be ready because the more you can do in class, the easier it will be to actually finish because I'll be here to answer your questions as you struggle through this during class. Okay? But again, hopefully it's not a struggle because it's pretty straightforward. So a couple more hands. Yes, sir. Okay. Other questions? Sure. And again, I'm going to be posting... It's basically just the uh, pre-tax margin, the EBIT margin times one minus the tax rate. Okay. So again, I'll post this as a video. <laughs> I'm not going to post the files. So the files you have to create yourself. Okay, but you have a video on what we did to post those files. That'll be up there shortly. See everybody on Wednesday. Question. Stop the video. Uh, this is April 2nd.